to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. The Fantasy Footballers back with you Tuesday, June 30th. We have a fun show for you today. We have some very exciting news to discuss, to dialogue about, to talk about, to figure out. You sure do. Well, I I almost went, I thought about it, and I'm sure there were were some people playing along uh, at home, and they did it. I thought about it, it's Newton time, but it just was... It was I, not enough. I was I was without a doubt hearing it's football time along with the music because I'm I'm just I'm just ready. But you're right. This is uh, it's not football time yet, no, Jason. But this is the you know the real thing. It's Newton time. Exactly. Whenever you get around seventy days away from something, that's that's when J- it's time. Jason gets hyped. Yeah, that's Set right. The seventy day mark. The seventy day mark is usually the day <laughs> that I get you know peak excitement, and it's all downhill from. <laughs> to be fair, that's basically like when we go peak Christmas. I was gonna say that's the Christmas. Like that's spirit. when the tree is up, seventy days out. Seventy, seventy, or in your case, uh, also seventy days after. Yes, wait, wait, all days before and after. Yeah, you still have not put. Is that right? You have not put your tree away. Oh, uh, the main one is put away, but there oh. there is a Christmas tree. You have a, ba- tree. a secondary? Yeah, there there's a, a white Christmas tree in our front room that's been up for I don't know years now. You're talking about the Fourth of July tree? Uh, yeah. I mean that's that's why it's there now. Yeah, the the Memorial Day tree. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we got it. Great show for you. We're bringing back the hold 'em or fold 'em segment. We did this last year live in New York City when people could congregate together, and it was legal. Yes. And good. <laughs> <laughs> and we hope it becomes that again someday soon. A reminder, head to ultimatedraftkit.com if you want access to the 2020 Ultimate Draft Kit. Lots of updates and changes based on the news that broke yesterday that we're going to talk about today. You can find us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. Here's a quick question of the day. It comes from Twitter from O'Doyle Rule. Think it, is that meant to be like Matt Rule? R- 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 Re O'Doyle? No. I think it's just from the Adam Sandler movie. You know, O'Doyle rules. Yeah, but it's spelled R U Y L E. We're just gonna let it go. All right. Look it's, at look at his last is, name. It's yeah, his I was gonna say, look at the last name of the of yeah. the listener here. Uh, he says, I am interested in joining a dynasty league, but I am afraid of it consuming my life like baseball leagues would. Just how much more time, on average, do you need to tend to these leagues? Uh you're welcome. Uh, let me just say, you're you're welcome if you're worried because we will do a lot of the tending to your league. If you're mm. listening to this show, one of the things that is, I think, really nice and comforting about this show, just, you know, you, you've got it in your daily listen. We have a good time. We entertain. It takes a lot of the work off your sh- You let us do the work mm-hmm. and you dominate. That's the uh, the subscribe and thrive plan. Oh, I like the uh, the the sound, the, ry- the rhythmic rhyming. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, that, so that is a part of it. Andy, you can speak to the baseball side, right? Because in a, in a baseball fantasy league, that does consume your life. Every single day, you have to be making transactions well, and lineups. To be fair, because the act of watching a baseball game just <laughs> it sucks, your, sucks your life out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you have less games by a lot in football to, to baseball. You're not managing lineup decisions in the same fashion because you're having to do them day to day and manage starts and things in baseball. The the heavy lifting of a dynasty league in football is not that heavy. It really isn't. Correct. I mean, th- there is what Jason said, a level of kind of acclimation to a deeper pool of players. That would be the biggest, I think, learning curve is you just have a much deeper pool of players. So your knowledge of, of you know, the third or fourth string player on a certain team actually matters. But that's why we talk about them and you can you can you know follow people on twitter you can listen to the show you can do your own research and um you know after you do that for a year you're going to feel pretty comfortable with dynasty and you're not going to feel like it's a burden you're going to feel like it's an extra layer of strategy and fun that you're you know having and it, you don't have waivers like you do in regular true. in redraft like you don't have that okay uh, i got to get all my bids in who's the big pickup cuz it's pretty rare when you have a pickup on a dynasty waiver wire, well, like depending on the size of the the league, 
So it's it's do you want to be really active looking for trades? Like that's in the off season, that's what it is. And well, the only pickups that you have are things like when I don't know a guy like holds Rob Gronkowski for like three years, yeah, uh, in a useless amount of time, just in case he ever returns to the league. But then he get you know he drops him like a week before he signs with another team, and then like Al Borland ends up signing him and stealing your soul. Yeah, those yeah, are the, the situations. Yeah, I mean the the nice thing about a dynasty league is in season it is it is much less work than your normal redraft league. It's the off season where you get a little bit more time, more fun because you know the NFL draft will matter a little bit more to you, maybe a lot more to you. Um, mm -hmm. and then and then you have your rookie draft. But I find that it pairs really like dynasty pairs really really well with your redraft to keeper leagues because. I don't want to have too many leagues. I want to care a lot about my leagues. And I could add another dynasty league or two outside of the startup draft. Then it's it's much easier to manage those leagues as the years go on. All right. Let's uh, jump into some news. News and notes from around the league. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to lead with... This the NFL with the buried news? has handed down penalties to the Patriots for their television crew filming the Bengals Browns game in December. One point one million in fines, a twenty twenty one third round pick that they lost, so they'll only have like three or four that year in comp right. in compensatory and whatever maneuvers they have, and then they are not allowed to shoot games during the twenty twenty season in Spygate Part Two. And it's irrelevant. And that's irrelevant because the real news is... Uh, oh, yes. He's back. Yes. Cam Newton. The projected destination for Cam Newton months and months ago. The hypothetical destination, New England. Right. The Patriots have signed Cam Newton to an incentive-laden one-year contract. He's back. And, you know, we all have thought about this for the last 24 hours. You know, I've seen analysts out there trying to get the projections out as fast as humanly possible. Let's be clear: this is not a, you know, cut and dry, no, simple situation. Rough. And there are Jared Stidham believers, and there are those out there that believe he'll be the day one starter. Um, but I've gotten to the point where I'm I'm pretty comfortable projecting Cam Newton as the starter for this team. It's a one year deal. But, but oh, Andy. oh yes, voice of public opinion. But they didn't pay him anything. He's he's on like a a minimum contract. In some ways, that is the knife twist that will be the sweet addition for Bill Belichick. Not only did he get Cam Newton, but he barely paid him. The, they don't have any money, right? The Patriots <laughs> they, are they don't have any money to make this transaction happen. And, and allegedly, they still made it happen. Allegedly, nobody else offered him a contract either. So if you're if you're Cam at this point, do you just hold out, knowing that there's going to be some injuries, things will happen, maybe a, a starting job opens up and then he goes and hopes he can get that or do you go to the Patriots for for very little money reset your career possibly like if if Cam's the starter and Cam has a great year Cam oh, is the starting get, quarterback for the Patriots for the Patriots or he's going to get paid. paid yeah uh yeah I mean the the reality here is if anything the fact that he took a one-year prove-it deal says he believes in his health um, versus waiting until a team was very desperate. But the the reports have come out that this has been in the works for months. Right, it's just been waiting on uh health, and I and I I believe that. I mean, you had Belichick after the draft talk about um they didn't go into the draft not planning you know planning to not draft a quarterback. That's just the way that draft fell, which kind of says they were looking at people. The, the which says what they believe about Stidham. And now they've gone out and and signed someone. I don't believe that you sign Cam Newton to come in and back up Stidham or to compete and cause that issue. I mean, it, I don't think that's helpful to Stidham. Well, and it's it's a difficult situation because it's the Patriots and and their plans. We don't know them, and Stidham is obviously in a better position to be the future of the team if he can deliver on the the kind of promise that they see in him. But I'm with you. I think that the fact that they probably wanted to draft a quarterback to compete with Stidham to begin with, the fact that this has been discussed as being in the works for months, tells me that, look, the, the plain and simple fact is they have a good defense. They were an elite team. They started, what, 8-0 last year. They have an opportunity. They have a window right now. 
And if Cam's the best opportunity for that, that's what you're going to get. And so let's let's talk about Cam as they, if he's the starter, what the implications right. are. Because obviously last year Cam didn't look okay. He was not no. a good, and he was coming off the best passing year of his career, where he was a sixty-seven seven yeah. percent passer. We've seen him have success with big-bodied receivers. Kelvin Benjamin comes to mind. So people are Devin looking at Devin Funches. Devin Funches. You look at Nikhil Harry, who's a monster physically, and you wonder. Is this a bump up for Nikhil Harry, knowing that you have a proven former MVP quarterback at 31 years old, now the likely starter on your team? Does the cap situation mean that someone like Rex Burkhead gets cut and now Muhammad, or uh, uh, Sony Michelle actually has more opportunity uh, on the ground and, and open lanes because you're That's not the just thing to me. clogging, you know, tr playing the run because it's Jared Stidham. We, we are, we are uh, acknowledged cardinal fans mm -hmm. we play the patriots this year i can tell you right now i would much rather play against jared stidham than against cam newton uh, and uh, so i here's the question that i have that i think is is very fun who wins more games in 2020 newton? the patriots yeah. or the buccaneers <sighs> the patriots the patriots right but you would you could have asked me that with Stidham, and I still would have said the Patriots. Oh no, I would not have. Tampa Bay is in a very tough division, so I think it could be real yes. close. I yes, think both teams are. could have a lot of success. I think the the thing about it with with when I say that about Stidham is because I think the Patriots can win games with ten points. Right, like they have well, that ability. But yeah, I mean that defense second half of the year was not the same as the first. The schedule, we know that. I mean, yes, I, the defense is good. It's probably not as good as it appeared last year. Yeah, I mean, it, Jason's point is is well made where if you were a fan of a team that wasn't New England and you thought about playing them or you're a Buffalo Bills fan and you thought about that division, you're, you're not smiling with this news. And that says who the starter is. Or is likely going to be. But yeah. can't be what's difficult for when I'm projecting uh, Cam as well, and I'm with you guys that – like I, I still think that Stidham has a chance to be the starting quarterback for the Patriots, but right at this point, I'm going to project the player who was a former MVP and is still in peak years of of athletic ability for a quarterback. But projecting him out is very interesting because he uh, Cam has always been a low volume passer comparatively to yeah, thirty two to thirty four hundred yard type right, of guy. What the Patriots have, are doing, where you know. Tom Brady averages what like 580 passing attempts in a in a full season. What does that look like for Cam? Is is Cam oh like is he really better? You know physically because the, he had that whole the the video where he came out and he talked about how beat up he actually was. He admitted how hurt he was and it needed the the surgery on his foot. Is Cam still going to be able to run the way that we are used to or do we actually, do we see Newton's passing yards go up? His attempts go up. the The rushing attack goes down at least a little bit. My, right now, Cam is my twentieth ranked quarterback. Just to put it out there, that's where his projections ended up for me. Um, managing the game, I've got him down for twenty two passing touchdowns, thirteen interceptions, a lower than career uh, average rushing attempt total of ninety. Okay, I, for, I have about, for about 388 yards on the ground. So that's where he lines up. Yeah, I, I believe he will still run, um, and I think that Belichick will utilize the skill set of Cam Newton uh, to its maximum degree. So I've got him for 111 uh, rushing attempts. Mm. I think he is going to run fewer, uh, much, much fewer passing attempts. Total as a team, I've got the Patriots down in their total plays ran. I think they're going to be a little bit more – uh, they're going to be slower pace of play with Cam, but uh, yeah, I've got him in four point uh, passing leagues at quarterback seventeen. So relevant, uh, draftable, certainly has a high upside with what he can do rushing. And and if favorite you think back, for comeback player of the year, yeah, top ten in uh, Vegas odds for MVP candidates, which is <laughs> so insane. insane. That was ridiculous. He, I gave him more passing attempts than he's used to having it. I didn't go up to the Tom Brady area. But with the you passing, got him over five hundred though. I have him over five hundred, okay. over five hundred passing attempts. And Cam Newton is currently a top twelve quarterback for me. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, you you have to acknowledge that being a quarterback one is within the range of outcomes here. Tom Brady was a quarter was a quarterback one last season, right? Um, and a lot's been made about how bad this receiving core is. You've got a thirty five year old Edelman, a Nikhil Harry who didn't do anything, Muhammad Sanu. But if you go back and look at you know Cam's MVP season and and who he was throwing the ball to, right. it was straight trash. And and not to you know again. I don't know if, if people are listening and they want us to declare the future. I, we can't do that. Certainly I, not I with New Well, Jason can, but that's because you have uh, some magic rocks. Maybe. But, but I can't declare the future with New England. We're just trying to lay it all out for you. I, there is still a percentage chance Cam Newton's not on this roster. I mean, there is a chance that he doesn't look himself. We've seen veterans come into New England, the Reggie Waynes, Eric Deckers, those type of guys. They walk in, they walk out. And he's not a financial commit. I mean, they spent $9 million on one game of Antonio Brown last year. They're spending a million dollars on Cam Newton unless he blows the top off of that expectation and they figure it out. So right now projected as a starter by all three of us. Yep. think he will be on day one. He gives them the best chance to win on paper right now. But not... It's all- you it's, know, not a guarantee. Yeah, it's all about the health. Because if he's healthy, I think it is a guarantee he's a starter. If he's not healthy, you're right. There's a yes. percentage chance here that he's not even on the roster. He can't get healthy. They, they just move on. Um, but with a list, Frank, and it was 100% the foot. You listen, everyone was, you know, Cam was talking about this last year. Everyone was worried about the shoulder, worried about the shoulder. He said it had nothing to do with that. It was ironically the preseason game when he played against the Patriots where he hurt the foot and then... Yeah, some uh, of those throws really look like the shoulder had something to yeah. do with it, though. Well, yeah, but imagine <laughs> that you have a foot that you c- can barely stand on and throw the ball. I mean, it, you're yeah. going to throw it different. You're going to throw it poorly. Two shoulder procedures in a three-year span. One to address the torn rotator cuff in 2017. One he for did, the yeah, he, scar tissue. Yeah, it just it wasn't. It was our injured player last year. It's not. He's only 31 years old. It is usually 12 months to return to peak performance from Alice Frank. The surgery was after week two of the season, so you're going to be coming when he starts the season. He's going to be near the timeline of peak performance, and Cam has a history of coming off of injuries well. Uh, this one makes you think he doesn't, but this was a brand new injury. Um, you remember when he walked mm-hmm. away from the truck accident? Yes. Yeah, he's, he's Superman for a reason. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, he just adds to the excitement for the upcoming year. Another player that, you know, another drop that we can keep hitting. Mm. Gotta love it. All right, you guys ready to do some hold'em, fold em? Hold them or fold them. All right. We're going to play a hold them or fold them. We're going to look at a player's average draft position, what they did last year, some of the narrative street out there in the fantasy community, the hype, all of the things heading into 2020. We're going to lay that out, and we're going to decide whether we're holding, whether we're going to fold them. Mm Mm-hmm. Am I going first? Yep. Yeah. Okay. You're up. We haven't talked about him a lot. I mean, we, the NFL fan community, has talked about him a lot, but we on the show, we haven't. I want to talk about Lamar Jackson. Okay. Last year, obviously, absolutely incredible, mind-bending type of season. Uh, 3,100 passing yards, 36 passing touchdowns, just six interceptions. The unheard of 1200 rushing yards seven rushing touchdowns league winner in every way shape and form he was good i mean just really unstoppable and um fantasy playoff weeks oh gosh he didn't leave anything off no no no. unless you played in week 17 championship yeah he was majestic 27 red zone carries as many as mark ingram had last year that's from the quarterback position 176 total carries as a quarterback that would be like 23rd in carry count among running backs altogether uh this was just an absolutely stunning year and when we talk about chasing that qb1 from years prior We've seen this. We've we've seen it in in different ways and shapes and forms. The Peyton Manning fifty touchdown years, the Brady fifty touchdown years, Patrick Mahomes MVP season compared to last year and what he does for your fantasy team. People chasing him. He's the early draft pick. Is it worth it? Is it valuable? Is it the direction you should go because you have this bona fide guarantee at quarterback? Because if you got what you got from Lamar, 
this year. Right. He is 100% worth that draft pick and probably a higher draft pick. His average draft position right now, 22 overall. Yeah, if you End knew. End of the second round. If you knew you were going to get last year, then yeah, he's, I mean, you probably take him in the back of the first. Like, he was so consistent and so, uh, he, he was a buzzsaw of like, he would win your whole matchup, just your quarterback, and that, that really doesn't happen very often. And the big thing with uh, with Lamar, like you said, I mean, he would be a first round pick. And you had years ago when people were taking Mike Vick in yep. the first round because of you know that amazing season. So all that being said, hold him, fold him with the draft position, with the consideration of mine. I am going to hold him. <laughs> I am going to hold him. Oh, and the fantasy community erupts. The late round quarterback strategy that we all adhere to says, what are you doing, Andy? And and the reason that I'm going to say, because right now you're looking at this 22nd pick in drafts. There's a chance you could be that first, the first pick in the draft. You could be taking the Christian McCaffrey and coming back. And Lamar Jackson could be one of your next two picks in the, at the end of the second round or the top of the first round okay. or uh, third round. The reason I think Lamar Jackson is a hold at that position without question is because of the differentiating factors in Lamar Jackson's game. And I went back and I looked at a, a player that to date before Lamar Jackson existed, Cam Newton, who supplemented each and every fantasy season with his floor, that, that um, incredible rushing baseline. And Cam was ridiculously consistent with top end finishes. His four 16 game seasons from his rookie year on, he finished third, fourth, third, and first. Now, that rookie season, I don't know if you remember this. I was looking up Cam stats 14 touchdowns on the ground yep. for Cam Newton, which is just silly. You look at what Lamar Jackson did last year, the yardage totals, the carry totals were just on another plane, another stratosphere. What wasn't was the touchdown totals at the quarterback position. It was seven on the ground. It wasn't an outlier in the kind of unpredictable touchdown realm. Do I think that Lamar Jackson is going to run this year as much as he did last year? I do. And I think that that characteristic, those levels, 1,200 yards rushing, yep. that breaks the position. <laughs> <laughs> this is not waiting for a player to throw another 50 through the air. He had 36 through the air. That probably comes down. If Lamar throws 30 touchdowns next year, 10 interceptions, and rushes for 1,200 yards and seven touchdowns, he's more than worth that pick to me. So sure. that's why I ended up in the hold, because I don't think 22 is insanity for what he offered teams last year. If he was his 11th, 12th, 13th pick in the draft, you'd be going, oh, my gosh, you're you're just betting too much of your team on him. But if he's your third pick, I yeah. don't know. That that's my argument. I knew it would be controversial. Yeah, it is. And, it is. And uh maybe I like it. Not a lot. <laughs> I don't like it. All right, it. so Mike, are you hold or fold on oh, on if, if fold? So you're fold, <laughs> yeah. you're adhering to the late I, round. I mean I'm adhering to the strategy because I believe it is the optimal strategy, and it's just We've, like you're saying, we we chase the quarterback one, and uh, even with Cam, or so when when Cam was awesome, you know, and it's three, four, three. But if you're getting the third quarterback in the third round or the back of the second round, it's a bad deal. That's not enough. That that is not a. He doesn't change your situation over the course of the season. He he will give you burst games and and win, of course, but. Over the season, it, it wouldn't be enough for me. Yeah, you're, what you're saying when you take Lamar Jackson is that he has to finish as the number one quarterback. Yes. The only way that he cannot finish as the number one quarterback and still be good is if it was, say, the number two quarterback, but it's because Pat Mahomes caught fire as well. Yep. Well, I, I am actually a hold him here, oh too. Oh, my God. Uh, I, I am in – this is super rare for me, for Andy, for us as a group to be in on an early quarterback, and I I, I, I – I not only see you shaking your head, Mike, I feel, I feel the listeners shaking their head saying, no, you can get a late round quarterback. We are late round quarterback truthers here. That's how we play the game. But at the same time, we always say you need to stay water and now you can't be a blind adherent to a strategy. If Mike here, maybe this will make it easier on you. Okay. 22nd overall pick is a running back with 1200 rushing yards and seven touchdowns. <laughs> I mean, that's your quarterback. This is not just a quarterback. 
Lamar Jackson's not just right. a quarterback. You're getting that a would quarterback be, and a running back in, in one in one slot. And I came into this offseason statting being Mr. Pat Mahomes. I believe he's going to bounce back to t- two years ago as far as like uh, electricity, not necessarily 50 touchdowns. But I, I statted him out knowing he would end as my first quarterback, and I probably still wouldn't draft him uh, where he's going to land. But that's how I looked at the Chiefs' offense. And when I finished and saw that Lamar Jackson had a healthy lead over Pat Mahomes – uh, I I believe Lamar Jackson, because of the rushing floor, barring injury, is pretty much a lock to be one of those top two quarterbacks. So yeah, I'm I'm uh so two holds, one two fold. Holds. I'm a surprising hold. Yep, mine's blown, and and really, um, history's on Mike's side. Just to be clear, history's yes. on Mike's side for that argument, and because it's what we've preached for years. But I do think that Lamar. Is categorically he is, different. He is different, yes. All right, I'm going to hop in next because I'm actually talking about one of Lamar Jackson's receiving options here in Mark Andrews. Mark Andrews, I, I picked two players where I genuinely didn't know where I stood on them. I know where I stand on the player and the outlook for the season, but that does not always equate to whether or not you draft him. Like, for instance, you're you know Lamar Jackson is going to have a great year, right, Mike? That is but correct. But you would not draft him. Yes. And so where am I on Mark Andrews as one of my two players? I believe in Mark Andrews quite a lot, but he's a tight end at a onesie position. So let's just recap who Mark Andrews is as a fantasy option, what his range of outcomes are. In 15 games last year, he had 10 touchdowns, 852 yards. That was only his second year as a tight end. Tight ends take a long time. To burst out. I, I talked about this uh, last week, the fact that Hayden Hurst leaving, I believe, is going to More open like up. like Hayden Burst. <laughs> sure. you, you just said burst out, so I was going oh, off of your words. All right. Yeah, okay. I don't, you yeah, have ca- to remember, I don't know what comes out of my mouth, Mike. <laughs> like, y- you knew that I said burst out. I yes. had no idea. I said oh, okay. Um, so here's the thing. Mark Andrews coming into year three. Without Hayden Hurst, I think could take a step forward. I have him right now ranked as my number three tight end ahead of Zach Ertz. I believe Mark Andrews is talented, and I think Lamar Jackson loses a little bit of the rushing, and but adds. I have him adding 60 passing attempts this season. Um, so hmm. Mark Andrews has the opportunity, I think, to break out. Everybody wants that next George Kittle. The previous Travis Kelsey, the the you know the the breakout guy before he breaks out, where you're going well, to spend. I feel like you want you want this upcoming year's Mark Andrews because he had that breakout year. Well, but he didn't. Mark Andrews last year broke out in fantasy, but he didn't cement himself as one of the absolute. Really? No, no, no. We'll look at where he's being drafted. He's being drafted in the fourth round. He has not catapulted up into the tier. Of Travis Kelsey and Fourth George Kittle, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. No, but you're, you're right that he's not Kittle and Kelsey, but you and but you just said he broke out in fantasy. No, he burst out. Did I'm, he burst? No, Hurst burst. Hurst burst. <laughs> Hurst gonna burst. <laughs> <laughs> Getting back on the rails here. <laughs> My point is that what he has not done is transformed into a hundred and thirty target number one tight end option. He came out and a lot of his, I mean, he had 10 touchdowns. He was one of only two receive, receiving options in the league to have double-digit touchdowns last year. So you have to worry a little bit, which is why he's in the fourth round, whether or not he's got enough volume to even be as good as he was last year or to take that next step forward. I believe in the talent. I believe in the quarterback, obviously. And so looking at what what I believe, in the fourth round, would I be willing to to draft who I think is the number three tight end in the league? Yes, and of I course am, you would after that argument. I am a foldum. I would not. And here's why. The number f- the fourth this, round. I am just so confused at what is, <laughs> what is the, happening. The fourth round tight ends over the last couple of years, the fourth and fifth round, those guys that get drafted right. there, they're exciting. They're on the precipice of taking that next step forward, a la O.J. Howard, um, Zach Ertz for several of these years, In Jordan Joku. Reed, um, you know Jimmy Graham on on one of the, these are no guarantees here, and I think in order to pay off in that fourth round value, because it's not just about whether he's good, 
It's about what are you giving up in the fourth round? And in the fourth round, there are some wide receivers that I am absolutely in love with. DJ Chark is going behind Mark Andrews. I'm not drafting uh, Mark, that is the correct move. Mark Andrews over over DJ Chark. He's going ahead of Calvin Ridley. I'm not drafting uh, a tight end who could take that breakout because here's the truth. I'm projecting 60 more passing attempts for Lamar Jackson. And that is about 460 passing attempts is a very low number. So th I don't see how Mark Andrews hops up to 130 targets. I think he's great. I think he'll finish the year okay. But he is not going to help my fantasy team as much as other players in the fourth round. I will take a shot on some of my favorite late round guys like Hayden Hurst, like Mike Gesicki, like Jonu Smith, who cost me nothing. And I will pair them in the draft with Calvin Ridley or DJ Chark or uh, AJ Brown, who he's going one spot next to in best ball leagues right now. So that's my fold him. Where do mm. you two stand on Mark Andrews? Yeah, I'll fold him for a fourth round pick. I don't see the need to invest. I don't think the passing volume increases. I think Hollywood Brown is more involved. They might add a piece in the passing game. And I don't, you know, 30 catches or whatever it was for Hayden Hurst last year. Uh, the way the NFL works, you don't just translate that to the next man up. I mean, it, I, I feel confident that Mark Andrews will be a top five tight end. Uh, I feel confident that Lamar Jackson loves throwing him the football more than just about anybody, but I'm not going to spend a fourth rounder on him. I mean, yeah. you spend a fourth round last year on Zach Ertz, who was the tight end three, and I could tell you he didn't help my team as much as other options in the fourth round, and Zach Fair. Ertz was good. Fair. Yes. Yeah, I, I wouldn't draft him over. The, the, the wide receivers right now in the fourth, we'll see, we'll see if ADP shakes up by the time August rolls around, but I want Mark Andrews on my team, but I don't think I can get him. All right. Uh, the name I would like to bring up for holding or folding, Cooper Cup, Ooh. wide receiver for the Los Angeles Rams, who was uh, absolutely on fire to start the year. He, I mean, it was, it, we, we hit this point of the season of like, do you try to trade? And then we're speaking to a, a trade we, with Andy. It was, do I try and trade Odell Beckham Jr., who's kind of flat right now? For Cooper Cup, and it's like, you can't possibly, yeah, you should probably try and do that <laughs> because Cooper Cup is absolutely crushing weeks two through five here as fantasy finishes, 13, four, five, nine. Jared Goff had a league best 135.4 passer rating when throwing it to Cooper Cup on third down. Like He was so reliable. He was so great. He Then he had a game of 200-plus yards, and then it fell apart. At the end of the year, where uh, he the production went away, the targets went away, the team moved to a different offensive philosophy. Can I just say that, just to interrupt you? Sure. That that it was annoying. That mm. was annoying for that to happen with Cooper Cup. Every year, there's a certain amount of games consecutively that a player can put up monumental numbers to where you finally feel like you can anoint them. Right. Like, mm -hmm. like I felt like I got to the point with Cooper Cup where I go, he is definitively a wide receiver one. He should be definitively thought about, traded for in dynasty leagues, considered a, a wide receiver one, and then uh, he. I think he cemented himself at that point in the season as a top five wide receiver. Yes, yeah, he he was absolutely fantastic, and then he was actually okay those final five games because he caught a touchdown in every single one. And I mean, which he's good at. Cooper so Cup, helpful. Cooper Cup does get touchdowns. So laying out what happened last year. And right now, uh, Cooper Cup has an ADP of wide receiver 13 in best ball. Am I holding or am I folding Cooper Cup? And I am folding. I have Cooper Cup ranked now as the wide receiver 21. So I am not saying it's all doom and gloom for Cooper Cup. I just can't possibly draft him at his ADP. And here is why. Like That end of season is so concerning to me. One, because the snaps went down. You know, those final five games, he was down at 63%, where he was, and he was averaging just six targets in those games. Five receptions, 56 yards. That was the, what he was averaging. The touchdown saved everything for fantasy purposes. But if you look, the real fantasy decline came week 10. This is coming off of the bye and coming off of his game where he was seven for 220 yards, where he absolutely destroyed the Cincinnati Bengals. That next game off the bye week, zero for zero. 
The next game, three for 53. You know what stands out about those two games? Brandon Cooks wasn't on the field. Cooper Cup had such a massive opportunity, and he didn't catch a single pass. Like, what What happened? And then you just, saw... They just seem so broken. They they absolutely did, and it, like people have been talking about it, and honestly, I can accept this, that like Cooper Cup was pushing himself back, or he did push himself back from the ACL surgery, rehabbing. He just... It, it fell apart for him. His, you know, tired, whatever it is when recovering from an ACL injury, I've never had to do it personally. And they're saying it just, it trailed off. But to me, how do your targets drop to six targets a game after the bye week? It, it, it wasn't just production. It was opportunity. It completely disappeared. And now there's also this, according to reception perception. So these are the words from Matt Harmon available in the ultimate draft kit. Cooper Cup has never finished above the 12th percentile in success rate versus man or press coverage at any point in his career. He cannot play outside. That is interesting to monitor after we saw Cup's snaps, snap rate fall in the closing weeks of 2019 when the Rams played fewer 11 personnel. We're all having to make a decision. Do the Rams really go to 12 personnel? Do they actually make the switch that they made for those final five games? Because there's a lot of implications. Like, Cooper Cup's production went down. Tyler Higby, if they stay in that system, Tyler Higby will be an absolute steal, or maybe it's Gerald Everett. But one of the tight ends, it's going to be incredible for, for, for fantasy purposes because if they're in 12 personnel, Cooper Cup can't go into the slot. And I have great concerns of these things happening. So, Cooper Cup, interesting. he's just outside of my top 20. I still think he'll have a, a solid fantasy year, but I can't draft him where he is going right now. Okay, and I, I understand those arguments. I'm glad that the Foot Clan is getting to hear that side of it because I think that that is obviously within the range of outcomes for Cooper Cup. We saw it at the end of last year. I am absolutely holding. I am not on sure. the hold side. I think that having an offseason and a plan without Brandon Cooks is different than when Cooks initially goes down and you're scrambling and the team looked like it was in shambles. I think with Cooks off the field, Cup is a great wide receiver. Cup is used by Jared Goff. Cup came in in his rookie year, was the 26th wide receiver in 15 games. Then the following year, he was a top 10 wide receiver until he got injured. Right. And then he was a top. So all he's done, just to recap, in his entire career, has been a top fantasy option at wide receiver or been off the field with injury i think an extra year removed from acl i'm in i've got him as my wide receiver nine I, oh my i have him a wide receiver six. Oh yeah. my goodness so i, guess so I have to holds. be a hold and the real thing again it all draws back what do you extrapolate from that end of the year when yep. i hear that matt Harmon statistic i say how much opportunity has cooper cup had to succeed on the outside how you know what are we extrapolating is this a man that can't succeed there or a man that has had limited opportunity to succeed there that's something that you look at you know we've had to deal with that with adam thielen a little bit going in inside sure outside uh i believe in the talent of cooper cup and the red zone prowess of cooper cup and um at the end of the day it's like they were broken at the end of last year i don't know if they're trying something new i have a hard time believing they can just put that into place in 2020 each and every week and have success. Uh, it, it seemed like an offensive line situation that they had to just do some hijinks to get around. Sure. But, but I would say it wasn't just hijinks results. Like they went from, yeah, but then they didn't make the playoffs. I mean, their push, their playoff push sure. was unsuccessful. So it's hard to, I get that, but their, their yeah. points per game. Like if you look at when they were, they had this weird lull in the middle of the field and all of a sudden they went back. Yeah. Jared Goff was great again. Yeah, their offense was was better. It was a success. They might not yeah. have they might not have made the playoffs, but they actually during that change they did win more games than they lost. They were three and two the last five games. If uh, uh, that's it's from a, memory, it's just tough. It's it's a bet. You you have a bet yep. on Cooper Cup based on what you saw at the end of the last year. Also based on Sean McVay, you know, and his ability to have success with those guys. Statistically speaking, I I have to be a hold, but I I get it. I get the uncertainty. Well, that's why I'm I'm genuinely happy that the argument was made because Foot Clan needs to know that in the range of outcomes when two of the three have him ranked so high. All right, let me work to confuse people. Uh, <laughs> my second player for Hold'em and Fold'em is A.J. Brown. 
Ooh, I, see, right. I didn't know who your players were. This is this is a lot of fun for me. You're uh, uh, gr- uh, great friends on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. AJ Brown needing some bulletin board material. <laughs> Found uh, a tweet of mine the other day where I uh, I was thankful. You know, I, I tend to be a positive tweeter, but you never know what someone's gonna find. And uh, it was uh, I had tweeted the worst mistake that AJ Brown ever made was standing next to DK Metcalf in that pre-draft photo. Because he's a monster. He's a yes. beast. He's a huge... Like, A.J. Brown is not of this world he's as much jacked. as yes. D.K. Metcalf is, you know, uh, a monstrous wide receiver, a big guy, uh, a big body Des Bryant-like guy. So it was kind of like you underestimated that physical prowess of A.J. Brown, which obviously he said, that was stupid to underestimate me. Look what I did on the field. And from a physical standpoint, I mean, I, just, I, I have this in here. According to Next Gen Stats, Brown led the league in yards after catch above expectation. No one was like him in the NFL last year in Correct. terms of, you know, taking the ball and going upfield and disappearing. I mean, he just manhandled people. So, you know, he responded and said, Hey, good. I'll just continue to be, you know, undervalued and I'll continue to do what I've done. Last year, from weeks 10 on in points per game, AJ Brown was the number two fantasy. Wide receiver. That's pretty good. Yeah, number two is all right. And, you know, we obviously saw what Ryan Tannehill did in that span. Now, you come into this year as ADP right now is the wide receiver 16. Mm. That's not. It's dropped. And why I said I was going to confuse the foot clan is because I kind of look at that and I'm confusing myself because I'm like, everything I, that happened. 16? 16. Oh, my so, goodness. So, see what I'm saying? No, so, you're, no I'm reevaluating you, uh-huh. Brown. <laughs> so, er, I, I er, think maybe we've. <laughs> Early in the offseason, sorry to interrupt, but early in the offseason, I know that he was like, he was up near top 10 at wide receiver. And, and these regression metrics, right? Touchdowns in 2019, he had eight of them. His touchdowns based on expectation for those routes and those plays would have been just three touchdowns. I mean, he was a player that essentially outperformed the opportunity in the same way that Tannehill did. We've made this argument all year long about how this team runs through Derrick Henry but now I see that wide receiver 16 number. <laughs> and you guys just talked about Mark Andrews. Mark Andrews versus the chance at the you know these stretches of games where he's the number two overall wide receiver, the player, the talent coming into the league. How much I loved A.J. Brown. And then he carries it out in one of the hardest, most difficult places to do it. Some place Corey Davis couldn't do it for years. Hey. And with his draft capital. And I thought I was going to say I'm still folding, but I'm not. No, I, you that, should not. That's no, I'm a, in. That's I'm a in. hold on, at draft pick overall 44. Shh. <laughs> Everyone shut your mouth. Let's keep him at wide receiver 16 it's just so too, that we can draft. because It's too affordable for a potential top 10 wide receiver. Well, what's his floor? Because I, I, I recognize that you take a bunch of touchdowns away, and the he floor- only had 52 receptions last year. Granted, that was as a rookie. Th- those will go up a little bit, but he's not a high-volume guy because this is not a high-volume passing offense. Yeah, but it was a rookie year, and he didn't surpass 55% of snaps until – Week uh, five. Yeah. Oh, it did. oh, so he wasn't gosh. even on the field, and we all knew that, and we all saw that, and it was a problem. So, what's his floor? Like wide receiver twenty? Yeah. I, yes. I his, mean, his floor so is, if you're is four wider, picks below. Yeah, if you're drafting a wide receiver sixteen, this is this is great information. This because is both of us were surprised. I, you know, we don't just sit there and study ADP every single day because it changes so often. Um, it was a bit shocking to me, and you you look at the situation. Here's what the problem that will happen, and we saw it in the playoffs, and those aren't manifested in the consistency charts on the website. He's going to disappear. There's going to be a week like week 13 where he's the 59. But every wide receiver kind of disappears. Mm-hmm. The real question is, is he going to win you weeks? Yes. And AJ Brown is, you know, a, a, a sophomore in the NFL. They brought back the player that made him the number two wide receiver from weeks 10 on. And your price is wide receiver 16 now. Not the kind of hype, not the kind of price that it was earlier in the offseason. People have cooled on him. They've cooled on Tannehill. They have not carried both of those numbers through to the ADP anymore. So at this point, I'm going to hold A.J. Brown. I, I would as well. Like I have him ranked right now as wide receiver 18, and, and that was almost hot takey. To the point of you, you can see how confused we are about that ADP drop. So 
He's yes. A four, he's a 14. So he's ahead of the, the ADP, yeah, and we got to... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. At that point, you've got a, you've got a safe enough floor and a high ceiling. So yeah, the, thanks for the information, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the player I'm going to bring up is one that I have had, uh, I would say, a battle with over the last couple of years. I've not been very kind to Mr. Odell Beckham Jr. That's true. Who has hurt many fantasy players, I would say, three years in a row. I realized that he was, I know, Mike always grimaces because the year before last. Because that's the year true. before. Nary a positive word from you on him. Nary a positive Nary word. Nary a positive word. The year before last, uh, Odell Beckham was, f- had a very strong overall season. He was very good. He finished as the wide receiver 16, but only played 12 games. Wide receiver 16 in 12 games is a very good season. But th- he obviously let everybody down because he was injured for the playoffs. Nobody won with Odell Beckham because he wasn't there when you needed him at the end of the season. My point is this. Back-to-back to back years of being drafted in the first round and not helping you win a championship. Uh, That's a you know, fair point. I mean, three consecutive years of and, that is and, true. And all three because of injury, right? He only played four games the first year. Then he missed the, you know, the four most important games the next year. And now this last year, he didn't, you know, he didn't miss games. He played all 16, except it was injury, right? That's what people are saying. It was, he was, he was hobbled. It was a core issue. Obviously it was injury he had it he had surgically surgery. fixed so i don't usually get elective surgeries for no reason i'm not like i wasn't injured we, but i would love you, you a core that, surgery yeah we were shooting for the, the clementine the, though right oh uh, yeah i was really wanting the clementine surgery yeah um so look odo beckham jr uh he has obviously had great spurts within uh his career he is a great wide receiver so, nary a kind word. There's, there are, there's definite, a kind word. There are kind words. He is a great wide receiver. He was playing with injury last year. There are a couple pretty crazy stats when it comes to o- Odell Beckham Jr. Um, you know, he had the second most deep targets in the NFL, which is great. Except, you know, that's it doesn't feel that great. Here's my favorite. Since 2000, since the year 2000, there have been 301 wide receiver seasons where they had 132 or more targets. It's a lot of targets, Mm -hmm. and that's a large sample size, 301. And Odell Beckham's last year ranks 277th in terms of PPR fantasy points. He stunk. He was trash last year for this Browns team, and Baker Mayfield was trash. So hold him or fold him, you would assume – I'm out again. I assumed I was out again. But I am actually a hold'em if the ADP holds on Odell Beckham, who is not a first-round pick, as I feared he might be again. He is a third-round pick. He is going right now between DJ Moore and Allen Robinson. Look, all of the, those three guys have worries to me. The, uh, DJ Moore sure. hasn't really proven it for a long time as a oh, quarterback so has good all to that hear, hear one of you two say that about dj Moore. i mean it's true waiting for that all summer we're, long we're DJ somebody Moore to say he's not guaranteed but he's not guaranteed alan robinson i've you know been on record being you know pitchforked and 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 uh torches with yes. you two coming after me for my lack of love for for alan robinson and and here with odell beckham at that point in the draft look 132 targets is a really nice number he had last year. And I think that he didn't get those for no reason. He got those because he is great. And the thing <laughs> is, he was complaining. is in 2016, Allen Robinson was 281st on, the, on that list of those 301. DeAndre Hopkins in 2016 was 285th. Mike Evans was 275th. Okay, so, so Otto Beckham was 277th. But the, the thing that's in common with these guys is that they're great, and that's why they kept getting that many targets even when they were struggling. And after those years, Hopkins, Allen Robinson, and Mike Evans have dominated. So if I'm picking in the third round, and I'm looking at ceiling, and I say which one of these guys could end up as the wide receiver one, only Odell Beckham is there. Allen Robinson is not wide receiver one. Uh, I, I don't believe no, DJ Moore did. is wide receiver one. And, and at that price... If he creeps up to the top of the second, well, I'm not competing with DJ Moore and Allen Robinson anymore. So right now I'm a hold on on Odell Beckham, and I think 
with that surgery, with that fixed, he's going to show that he is a great wide receiver this year. The wow. biggest risk wow. is obviously injury. Because this is a real eye-opening episode. <laughs> I'm, I'm most certainly a fold on Odell Beckham Jr. At that price. We just talked about mm. a receiver around later that I, I think has just as much of a chance to be wide receiver one as Beckham does. Sure. I mean, the argument for for A.J. Brown uh, a round and a half later, I feel like he's just as much of a dice roll on production as Odell Beckham has been based on the past three years. You okay. mix that with a concerning Baker Mayfield season that could mean quarterback tumult and the Kevin Stefanski hire. And it does not make me feel cozy in the third round. I, I get that. I love the fourth round wide receivers right now. I love AJ Brown. His value is better to me than Odell Beckham's value. So, but the question isn't which one are you taking. You're playing that ADP game when you're on the clock. So here's the the running backs. Let's say M maybe you agree. Sure. You're not a huge DJ Moore fan. Here's the running backs that are right there: Lev Bell, Chris Carson, James Conner. You're saying versus Odell versus Odell Beckham. Lev Bell, Chris Carson, James Conner. Yeah. Chris Carson's interesting, but I. My yeah, point I is, mean, you're going to have to draft someone in that round. I, and I'm not excited. I bypass. About any of them. Yeah, you know how I draft, yield. I'm drafting AJ Brown now. In, in that, the, in that the round. third. No. Sure. I mean, maybe. <laughs> no, maybe I mean, that the, is the heads right up with do. Odell Beckham Jr. It's very close between those two. So, but you're a fold, and Mike, I, I am a fold. Yeah, Mike, where are you? Um, I have Beckham right now at twenty. Uh, I I think I would hold for now because I I. My argument well, he's being drafted at wide receiver ten, but you would still hold. I have him at thirteen in my range. Well, yeah, he's at wide receiver ten because the wow, oh, man, that's just that's really high. That's much much higher than I have him ranked. That was the the argument for what you were talking about, Jason. I was going to say, yeah, but he gets the targets. You had since uh, cleared that up. Like he's going to get the targets. It, yes. A, I don't know though, man. Austin Hooper's arrival. Jarvis Landry gets his targets. Yeah. Well, Jarvis Kareem got, Hunt gets his targets. Jarvis got his last year. All right. Yeah. So. Real quick, I've got to throw. They weren't throw, pretty targets. I've got to throw to Brooks because the head has been more vigorous than I have ever seen. He doesn't even know he's been doing this. Nodding in agreement when I talk about his injuries. Nodding in agreement when, uh, you know, you're. I, I think this is a strong fold, but maybe I'm reading the head movement wrong. Uh, Brooks, Judge Giamatti, where do you stand? Hold or fold on Odell Beckham Jr.? Fold him. Yeah, I, knew, I mean, I, that that head was he was he, You could see a lot out. of emotion over there. I feel like usual me would be listening to this and screaming at me saying, he's such an injury risk. Well, later, what are you doing? Later, you might be listening to this and screaming at you. That's true. Uh, it, it's a matter of whether or his Or last ADP year's Odell Beckham, holds. you would have yeah. been yeah. screaming. Stay water, my friends. I you See, it's funny. The ADP, in the way that A.J. Brown shocked me that it was late, it kind of shocked me that... Beckham was this significantly above where A.J. Brown was. Yeah, it's wild. And also, but I have to do this, Jason. Okay. Into the this bust year of 2018, yeah, I get it. He got hurt, and he wasn't there for the fantasy playoffs. But he was the wide was receiver great. seven up until that point. He through, was great. Through 12 games. You're speaking my point here, Mike. He got you to the playoffs. That's yes, not a bust. That's so, I, it's so ridiculous to call him that. I look for the purpose of this you argument. Call him a I bust agree. Last year, Mike. Last year, I, yes, he was a, he was a bust compared to his his ADP. Yeah, yeah. Last year he was an, he was a uh, disaster, unmitigated yeah. disaster. Yeah, for sure. I mean, all right. Yeah, who we got, Mike? All Final right, one. I don't think I really fully understood the game that we were going to play of this trying to <laughs> trying to set up a a player who is ambiguous. Uh, so do you want to ask us our opinion before you even give your case? Sure. Let me ask you the opinion, your opinion on a wide receiver who's currently being drafted in best ball in the 13th round. He's the wide receiver 55, oh. which is pretty sweet. 55! Thank you. Better late than never. Uh, but, but so like, at that point, if you're folding on a guy for me to bring him up, doesn't really make much sense. But I looked I, when I was trying to find the player I wanted to talk about. I looked at someone who has a huge disparity in ADP and where I have them ranked, and I understand me bringing this player's name up right here after I just talked about Daniel Jones is going to make me look like I have now become a Giants homer and a Giants truther, which is not the truth. But I want to talk about Golden Tate, wide receiver for the New York Giants, 
who was actually much better than people remember and people realize. He started the year off with a four-game suspension. Yeah, way to go, Golden. That didn't help you. As Jason would say, that's a bust. <laughs> if you draft him, yeah, it didn't feel good. Which we, we said, don't draft Golden Tate because you, you don't want to sit through a four-game Yeah, you can pick suspension. him up later. And week one, he was very bad. Like, But, look, I get it. You're coming off a four-game suspension. You're not acclimated to the team. But after that game, he was a top 36 wide receiver in every single game he played with Daniel Jones. He was a top 24 wide receiver in five of eight of those games. The way I'm, the reason I'm phrasing it like that is because Daniel Jones did miss a couple games and Golden Tate was not great when the ghost of Eli Manning came back into the NFL. But he was very good with Daniel Jones. He had big games. He was averaging 14 points per game in a half-point scoring situation, which is – that's excellent to be averaging that number, even with the games of Eli Manning from week six, which is week six on, which is removing his first game. He was the wide receiver 21, and you are getting him absolutely free as wide receiver 55. Now, I can make the argument. What you were no, going to No, no, no. Go oh, ahead. I can make the argument against Golden Tate of saying, you know, they had such a, a roulette wheel of wide receivers. When was Sterling Shepard in? Uh, Slayton, when was he in? These guys all had their own injury problems. But you have to remember, why is Golden Tate on the New York Giants? They traded Odell Beckham away, and then almost immediately after that, they gave Golden Tate a four-year, $37.5 million deal with $23 million guaranteed. They picked him up to be their wide receiver one, and he came through for fantasy purposes. It's a tough sell for me. It, the Golden Tates and Jamison Crowders of the world, they feel like the, you, you know when you go to the buffet restaurant mm -hmm. and even though they have like some steak laying out there or they have the, the meal that's supposed to be really expensive, you only get so good of a meal at one of those restaurants. Jamison Crowder and Golden Tate feels to me like Look, we've been around the block with these players. Five years of Crowder's career, or a bunch of Golden Tate's career. He'll be 32 years old. You love Evan Ingram this year. Darius Slayton came out of the woodwork. They didn't know about him when they signed Golden Tate. And you got to pay veterans a lot more money. I mean, somebody like Golden Tate, to get him to your roster, yes. you got to pay him a lot more money. I just, you know, I know I've seen the best of Golden Tate. Do, does anybody disagree with that contention? The I best do not. of The best of Golden Tate? I, I It's do in not the past. Think. I, I do not disagree. I right, agree. Right. And so I I wonder <laughs> now what you're saying. I mean, look, the guy's not being drafted. I've, so if he's a free player, I mean, it well, doesn't my hurt point, you to have him on your team. My point is he is the leftover of the wide receivers from the Giants. He's being drafted behind Slayton and drafted behind Sterling Shepard. And he would be for me. So I guess that makes him a fold. I would draft both those other players over All Golden right. Tate. I looked at my rankings. I was curious where I have him ranked because when I think about Golden Tate, I think he's being overlooked. Um, and he, he clearly at wide receiver 55, he uh, could end up being a value. I have him ranked at wide receiver 54. And so I think he's about right. where he should be. And, and when I go and I look at his game logs last year, you're right. He was pretty good for fantasy, but uh, you know, you just talked about, well, he, the touchdowns came for Cooper Cup. That kind of happened for Golden Tate. He had, uh, you know, in in the shortened time span, he had those six touchdowns. Well, he's a six or seven touchdown guy over the course of a season, and we've seen that his whole career. He was on pace for 10 touchdowns, and I, you know, he had a week, you know, three receptions, 33 yards, but a touchdown. So he was okay for fantasy that week. Look, I've, I've said it forever. This is my weakness in fantasy. I don't like the wide receiver two or three perceptively. Like, I just don't see the value. Like, when I think of Slayton, I'm like, well, I don't know what Slayton could be. <laughs> and I don't know. And you have to say his name like that. Slayton. Slayton. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Lefko. He, he could be a superstar. <laughs> um, yeah, but, I mean. But I know what Tate, Tate is, and I know he's not going to be the anchor of my football if team. If Tate is the one, then he is yep. a value. That's, that's just flat out. I don't know that there is a one. I think there's going to be a one. This game, and it's going to be different that game, and it's going to be different the next game, and so that's kind of. I know my you issue. like him, Mike, and I'm trying I to. Do. I'm trying to listen. I'm trying to. to I feel learn. bad. I feel like I'm. I've, no, no. I mean, it's it's okay. Like yeah, Jamison I, Crowder or Golden Tate. Golden Mike. Tate by a lot. Really? Yes. Interesting. So Golden, yeah. 
Okay. No, I, I, I like Daniel Jones, so I'm going to like some of the guys that he's throwing the ball to. Makes and sense. of the wide receivers, I think that it is easily Golden Tate as the number one. What does that really mean? Like you Fantasy finish-wise compared to his ADP. Obviously, you yeah, would certainly, have him ranked. Let me, let me like, what does a good season feel like for, for Golden Tate? Last year, you can throw out the fantasy finish if you want with the suspension. Year before with Stafford, he was 33rd in 15 games. I, I mean, to, to Mike's credit, if you throw out that first game back as, after the four games, so those first five weeks where he wasn't there for four and then was you know sucked in the first week, he was on pace for 1,010, which if – which would be well, great. Well, like I said, in that time, he was the wide receiver 21. 10 is, 10 is insane. That's my point, is I don't think Golden Tate's a 10 touchdown receiving. Fine, so where but, do you have him ranked? So right now I have him 29. So I have him as a top 30 wide receiver, which is an unbelievable value for yes. for a wide receiver who's going in the 50s. And he's going to have – I like him. I, I think I like he's the number one. It, it, yeah, he's a wide receiver 21 from week six on, for what it's worth. Yes. Even with the, the problems at the quarterback position. So – I always hate like opposing an opinion on a player being drafted as the 55th wide receiver. That's why I said it because was Because opposing not- the opinion is of no value to you. But if- we were able to do it. And that's what's <laughs> and that's what's most important is that we were able to no matter what, no matter how good the value is. Cuz it's really just upside. If you want to stack him at the end of your bench and and it, you know Mike's wrong, oh my gosh, wow, you you got a guy at the end of the bench to cut. Mike's right, then you have a steal. One of the things that um, does come to mind is that this year I am wanting to draft a little bit more reliable depth than just swinging for the fence. And so he does fit that bill, right? You can you just laid out the argument for his upside, but you know that he's going to be fantasy relevant in a pinch. You could start him. Yes. He, you don't know that about Darius Slate. That's how I feel Darius about Slate Crowder. Could, you could just could put Crowder in your lineup and you'll be okay. And so those type of players I am looking at in the 13th round. So I'm not like a complete you know, punt him off the bridge situation. No, that'd be rude. I I laugh now because I was very staunch in Golden Tate. Easily oh, he's got to be at your like- I, No, I have Crowder at 32, so he's three spots behind okay. Golden Tate. They do seem – That's they really, still real easy, They though. feel similar to me. They really do. Um, Want to thank Pristine Auction for supporting the show. They got thousands of daily auctions. Everything starts at a buck, runs for 24 hours, sports memorabilia that you just cannot get anywhere else. Uh, recent daily auction that just ended a Devonte Adams signed jersey for seventy seven dollars. We're actually giving away a Devonte Adams signed jersey at FootClanGiveaway dot com from Pristine Auction right now, so you can check that out. And if you go sign up at PristineAuction dot com, use the code Ballers, and you'll get a ten dollar credit towards that first purchase. Woo! We made it. What a show, gentlemen! What a show! Unbelievable! And Five there'll be stars. another show on Thursday. Yep, that's true. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.